All right, good morning, everyone. Hi, okay, good, so you can hear me. That's always important. Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, August District 3 community meeting. My name is Christian Horvath, and I will be your host. Uh, just gonna make sure that everybody is muted, uh, unless you are talking. All right, so uh, as we uh, do uh, occasionally here, th there is not a topic per se for this month. This is open forum, which means we can talk about anything that's on your mind or you want to discuss. Uh, and so with that said, I will just open it up to questions right off the bat here. If you want to raise your hand down at the bottom, it says reactions. If you click on that, there'll be a raise hand uh, feature and you can do that. If for some reason that's not working, then you can just wildly wave your hand on video. And uh, if I see you, then I will just call in the order of uh, the way I see your hands going up. Who would like to go first? Okay, Shannon, uh, just unmute yourself. Hi, good morning. Good morning. I'm tuning in because I was on next door and I noticed that you mentioned this on next door as part of the conversation was has started with the new proposal for AES and that's really what I'm looking forward to this morning is to hear your information and try and cut through some of the disinformation that may be going on already. Sure, sure. Well, you, why don't we start off? Why don't, do you want to ask specific questions and then I can try to, you know, uh, break through and, and answer anything, you know, that I am aware of or know of, and then I can always expound upon that. But if you have specific questions, let's start there. Sure. Does the city have the ability to, I mean, is zoning wise, is, is this going to be a zoning issue right off the bat? I, I mean, I'm not thrilled with it. I, let, let me also, just for transparency sake, I'm not in your district. I'm, I'm in uh, Todd's district, but because of this AES conversation, I wanted to get on here and get any news I could right away. Totally. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the height of, of the buildings and the number of residences, 2,300 residences yeah. is, you know, we went from the last proposal of what I believe was around 650 to, you know, three times that, if right. not more, a little more. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so, but yeah, I, I, I agree with your concerns, right? You know, I think the, the plans as they were, as they came out in the paper were a surprise to everybody. Um, you know, I think we all learned about it at the same time. Wow. Um, you know, uh, well, here, I guess let, let me I'll, I'll try to frame this first, you know, uh, with with some background, right? Because I think so much has happened uh, regarding this site, or there's been so much conversation about this site for so many years, with different people saying different things, right? And and that leads to to voter confusion, and then there's ballot initiatives, more voter confusion, right? I mean, I think at at some point people start to go, I don't know what is or is not you know, factual, real, or, or what's possible, right? So um, if we go back to the, the turn of the century, the city at that time uh, was, was coming up with a, a plan, if you will. We, didn't, we don't own that property, right? That property was owned by AES and previous to AES, it was owned by Southern California Edison, right? It has been a functional power plant for about a hundred years, right? Um, but uh but you know cities try to think forward right and they try to uh especially as it relates to zoning and allowable uses and so around the turn of the century here you know the the city at the planning commission level and and the city council level was talking about the idea of what could eventually happen on that site assuming the power plant would close right and um and this was called the heart of the city. So anybody who's been around long enough, you know, remembers that. And and I'm sure everybody remembers that Chris Cagle, you know, put a letter in the paper saying, is anybody else concerned about this? You know, and it led to a lot of resident outcry and conversation. And at that point, you know, uh, most cities control their own zoning uh, just at the uh, planning commission slash council level, right? 
Um, and, and so that, that was an allowable procedure at that point in time. Um, but with all the public outcry and whatnot, and that was for, I, I want to say, well over 3,000 potential units and, you know, commercial activity. It was, it was rather big and, and people said, nah, that's, that's not what we want, right? And, you know, if we go historically further back, I think there's, there's always been, especially in the waterfront areas from District 1 through District 2, um, an uneasiness with, uh, with development in general because of what happened in uh, the 60s and 70s with the, the tall buildings going up on the Esplanade, the destruction of downtown, you know, and, and the building of all the condos, right? There's a lot of hard bad feelings about stuff that happened decades ago. Uh, and it still lingers today, especially with individuals who have been here through all of that. Um, so uh, what ended up happening was the, the the council rescinded that whole heart of the city thing, right? It didn't move forward, it didn't, not, nothing came of it. Um, and then the the individuals like Chris Cagle and, and whatnot, you know, the, you know, activists, whatever you want to call those individuals who had been activated by that, um, you know, uh, Chris Cagle eventually got on city council. Um, and around 2003, uh, the city put forward two advisory votes. Um, and in these advisory votes, th these votes have have no implication on creating anything going forward right but i think what they were meant and as i wrote in a next door post they were meant to really gauge like well what what do people want you know down there right because i mean let's face it in a town of seventy thousand people there are seventy thousand different opinions and it makes it really challenging to ever effectuate any type of change or or whatnot so the two advisory votes uh, were on the same ballot and they, they they were just different plans, right? One of the plans had like a Venice kind of, I think it was called like Heart Park or something like that, you know, and there was like water and uh, and then there was there was another plan, right? And there was two different groups of people that were supporting them. And and I think, you know, one plan maybe got more votes than the other. But the, the point being that clearly people still were not in sync about, hey, wh what would work down there? Um, shortly after that, uh, then the city went into the entire um, kind of rethinking the waterfront process, right? Uh, and we we hired a consultant. I shouldn't say we, because I wasn't part of the city council at that time, but hired a consultant. They put together that whole, um, like what could potentially be these allowable zoning in the waterfront area. And that that's going all the way from basin one out to the pier, right? Um, and uh and eventually that that's what eventually that that whole cosmon waterfront plan eventually became measure g which was a 2010 ballot initiative uh and it rezoned um the waterfront area uh a lot of people speculate that it, it you could have put 1.6 million uh square foot of new development in the waterfront area prior to measure g measure g knocked that down to four hundred thousand square feet measure g also um stipulated that the power plant area uh would be zoned as a uh, you know like a uh, a generating plant slash park right so that's the first time in 2010 that we kind of have this underlay of like hey if anything changes here we're starting at the baseline level of park right um so uh after uh the, the city going back to say like 2007 2008 when this cosmon plan passed at that point again the city still was able to make zoning changes on their own right vis-a-vis -vis the planning commission and the city council and um and mayor brand who was at that point uh just resident brand if you will and and jim Lighton, uh they they put together measure dd right and that was in 2008 and uh and what that said was hey uh anytime we're going to do any type of up zoning anywhere in the city at any time uh, that's going to require a vote of the people and so uh, that passed and uh and then they sued the city about the waterfront stuff which led to measure g measure g passed and uh and so now here we are in a situation where if we want to make changes anywhere it does need to come to a vote of the people 
And for the past four and a half years, the city has been in a general plan process, right? This is now rethinking where are we going for the next 20 to 30 years in terms of our zoning. And so the general plan advisory committee has been has been you know thoughtfully trying to really think about this and now one of the things they haven't been able to discuss ironically is the aes plan and and i should reiterate again right that is a privately owned piece of property so all that said right um and sorry about the long-winded answer but i just want to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page as we as we talk about this um the owner of that property who is now not aes uh it is is now privately owned and he is leasing it back to aes for their operations and the only reason that they are even operating right now is that the state water board has granted them two extensions they were supposed to shut down at the end of 2020. that that was you know determined in 2010 and uh and now you know with energy power grid Bull crap, and I, I in many cases I do call it bull crap because I I spoke to the water board and showed them the math and they didn't agree with me. But the math I think speaks for itself that we don't need the plant open. Uh, they've extended it to the end of 2023, and I'm hoping that that is the end of the extensions. But you know, with the way things happen politically in Sacramento, one never knows. So. Um, so Mr. Pastilnikov, who bought the property. Um, anything he wants to do there he will he would have to go through uh, the process of working with the city and the residents right to build support for his project um and and you know for a while there mr pastilnikov was working hand in hand with the city uh including mayor brand about what would eventually happen there and it seemed to be a harmonious relationship for a bit uh, we were in discussions. I'm on the AES subcommittee uh, with Councilmember Lowenstein and Mayor Brand. We were in discussions. We had gotten grant monies, you know, about purchasing up to 25 acres of the site for public use, right? And then the other 25 acres would be whatever he eventually would propose. Um, that fell through when they decided to extend the plant. Um, and, and, uh it strained uh the relationships or any relationships that had been there um and so now there is a, a bit of uh a, a bit of tension between mr pastilnikov and some of my colleagues you know uh, both verbally you know outright and uh and so in many ways you know i look at you know part of what's happening here as like this is just people playing with each other and and uh you know uh, messing messing with them uh, I could be wrong but uh but his plan which, which in my mind is absurd because I think anybody anybody who comes in and purchases that property is going to look at historically everything we just talked about right and they're gonna they're going to recognize that hey this is a a, a hot button issue in, in a city and if i want to effectuate any change there i'm really going to have to figure out how do i do that in a in a generative way that brings everybody along with me and gets them to vote yes right but during these past four or five years right sacramento has also been throwing at us you know these housing bills over and over and over again right and and you know some of them are well intentioned right i i want i do want to say that like th there is there is good intention behind them but not necessarily a lot of thought uh behind what are the unintended consequences of these bills and how are they going to affect us and they're also kind of an umbrella um uh all the bills are taking like this one size fits all approach right and and i think we could all probably agree that every city is slightly different in many ways right so redondo beach is not going to be uh the same as the city of los angeles or or someplace out in the desert or way up north you know in in, in the mountains um you know and so to treat every city exactly the same based on you know some language i i think has been short-sighted on sacramento's part and it's created a lot of pushback you know and and our council has actually been unified in in the pushback because local zoning is supposed is supposed to be uh 
something that each city uh, is in charge of, not the state. So we have been dealing with these mandates from the state now for a few years and they keep coming and, uh, and they affect everything we do. And so one of the things we're in the process of doing right now is a housing element. Uh, and that housing element, it happens every eight years. And, uh, and as a part of that process, the state assigns a number of units that every city needs to build for uh, or or zone for i shouldn't say build that needs to zone for uh for allowable uh potential builds so that basically we we can ensure that there is enough housing for everybody that wants it right and and they break that down into multiple categories uh, uh based on your economic you know uh level uh and and clearly you know we have i mean i i think we don't need to argue this there is an affordability crisis not just here in california but everywhere right um and there is also an enormous amount of economic disparity throughout the country and in california as well right so these are all compounding issues uh homelessness is a part of that compounding issue uh and so what we're supposed to do is we are supposed to figure out how to absorb these rena numbers that's what they're called the regional housing needs allocation um and every city is in the same boat we are in in our case our numbers jumped up dramatically as did everybody else's in this most recent cycle and we are supposed we are supposed to absorb about like 2500 or so units uh and create zoning to allow that and the conversation uh this has been a bit of a split conversation here uh they have wanted uh my colleagues the the council majority have wanted to put the vast majority of that allocation in north redondo beach district four district five and district three district four being the uh taking the brunt of it um, and Councilwoman MD and I have argued from the start, along with over 500 residents who submitted comments uh, back a year and a half ago on this, to just equitably distribute these numbers throughout the city. And that's and that goes in line with the the planning that the the General Plan Advisory Committee has done. Again, the AES site was off the table in this general plan conversation, right? So therefore. In some cases, the AES site has been off the table uh, uh, in terms of, of any housing. What Mr. Pastilnikov is doing here is arguing that, one, uh, he is able to use that site to build housing and build uh, a necessary amount of affordable housing. And so uh, he should be allowed to do that based on certain state laws that have passed. And he is, uh, he's using SB 330 and uh and this idea that um if he's being blocked in one way or another that he should be allowed to do it uh, now i don't know if if legally his argument carries water i don't know and i would i would um assume we haven't had a council meeting uh since this happened but i would assume at our next council meeting on closed session we will be probably discussing that because i'm pretty sure the city attorney is is looking at that is that a valid legal argument and does the city have uh any ability to push back um you know the aes site is in the coastal zone so that creates another level of complication uh for for i think this particular angle that the developer is taking um so you know, this was a really long-winded answer to your uh, to your question, and you also mentioned, um, you know, the 600 units, right? Measure B in 2015, right? Measure B was AES's um, ballot initiative to rezone, right? That, and they were doing it the way it should be done, right? Hey, we're going to put it on a ballot. Let's see what what people think about it. Now they went with 600 units because it was vastly different than that heart of the city like over 3000 right so they thought 600 was a good compromise and still people said no right we can only say no up to a certain point right and uh and so i think you know you know i'm trying to be pragmatic about this whole thing uh, council council member lowenstein myself and mayor brand are on that subcommittee and we did um we did an exercise with a consultant uh, a few years back before Mr. Pastilnikov purchased the property 
to, to gain, really gain an understanding for ourselves of like what could happen on that site, what was the economic viability of it. And it was really, it was a fascinating exercise for me because, you know, you really start to get into the, the granularity of like, what is a developer looking for and how do they make their return on investment? Um, and, you know, uh, and I think I've said this publicly here in my community meetings and also at, at council, you know, what we ultimately came out with after a few months of that was that there had to be some residential component right and that that was really a key metric for somebody to to make their return on investment for the purchase of that property um and and i feel like the lowest numbers we got at was like somewhere between 150 and 200 units now in that case the vast majority of those units are going to be kind of like high upscale they're not going to you know there, there there has to be an affordable component that is a a baseline um mandate by the coastal commission uh but still the vast majority of them would be i think you know i don't want to say mansions or whatever but they would be really high-end um, stuff so uh now some of my colleagues think there should be absolutely zero residential i'm not i'm not here to say there should or there shouldn't be when i'm just trying to present that like there quite possibly may need to be and so what is that threshold that we as a community are going to say is okay you know um when when the council and you know some of the activists on the no growth side were talking with Mr. Pastilnikov before things fell out, you know, uh, they were talking about putting a tower uh, on the site, you know, as a way to create 25 acres of parkland, right? So is there a trade off, you know, are we okay? Like, hey, if there was a tower, you know, of residential and or hotel or whatever, would that be an acceptable solution in order to also gain all this public space? I don't know, you know, but I, I think at some point we have to all kind of step back from, from, you know, a, a very hard nosed perspective and say, what is it that we really want? And are we willing to compromise? And I think that's, you know, this conversation now with what he has proposed, I think he's gone a little bit way too, too far to, to the, to, to the high end. And who knows, you know, that that also could be a tactic to then allow him to change his plan over the coming years and and make it smaller and more uh, more acceptable. I, I have no idea, uh, but I can definitely say, uh, at least for the next seven months that I'll be sitting in this seat, you know, I'm sure this is going to be a, a, a topic of conversation that we will continue to explore. So, Shannon. <laughs> Is there anything I missed? <laughs> and that, was, that was a terrific summary. I was just taking us from the past, even going back into the 60s and in, in prior decades and kind of setting the tone for how our community feels about these things. I, for one, you know, obviously the power plant is, is just a, a horrible thing sitting there on our beach. Sure. And so I'm, you know, definitely on the side of looking for a compromise, and I'm with you, looking for a compromise that makes sense in terms of how we develop that land or how a private individual like this gentleman develops the land responsibly so that the community um, has an opportunity to grow and be what Redondo is. And so but when I saw these plans this last week, I it just was really disheartening because it just seems, and I guess I have a, uh, let me do a step back question beyond my comment, I, and I'll try and let somebody else jump in because I'm sure there are others who might have questions. But with the directive for the low income housing, when you're talking, he's talking about 2,300 residences, is it a 20% cap of that, that so 200 of those would be, or 400 of them would be um, low income housing? Is there, is, is there, when you were talking about your threshold with meeting those things? Yeah, well, uh, so I, I think what he is proposing uh, is a, at least a minimum of 20%, right, in order to, um, in order to kind of meet the intent of SB 330 and, and some of these state mandates, right? In the Coastal Commission in general, 
when you uh, when you do a project in the coastal zone, you have to have 10 percent of uh, of the units as affordable. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's just a baseline. Right. So but if he goes above and beyond that. Right. And he meets the thresholds uh, for for what the state is is requesting, then that that could give him, you know, potentially. And I'm assuming that's how he's seeing it, is that he is. Uh, trying to meet the intention of these state laws, the possibility of being able to do it without having to go the normal city route. And do you know, because I think in the newspaper article it mentioned that the original AES building that is sitting there is right around 100 foot tall. So is, that's a good gauge to kind of go, okay, that 100 foot tall building is still going to be there, plus two new buildings that are going to be 200 feet and one that's going to be 160 feet. Is that about yeah. right? I, I well, yeah, I'd, ha I, I'd have to, I, I could pull it up here. I, I don't know if, I, I remember seeing there was two different visuals I saw. Okay, so I'm looking at this visual here. I mean, there's a lot of tall buildings going on in general. Um, yeah. in, in this, that, and, and the other, but you know, according to this diagram that was in the paper, uh, some of them are definitely taller than the um, than that main building that ha hosts all the generators right now down on Harbor Drive. Right. Uh, you know, he had. I will say this: he had talked about keeping that building in general, right, and repurposing it. And I don't know if anybody's ever been inside there. We've done uh, some art exhibits there. It's really wildly fascinating you know it's it's pretty much non-operational um but it but it, it it could be repurposed into something and i think that's he's talked about that right from the get-go um uh but the all the other buildings yeah that those those are you know those would be very different and i don't think anybody you know wants to see that you know I, I, I personally would almost rather, you know, have like one or two taller buildings that don't necessarily impede a view, you know, of a, like th th this is just an enormous amount of massing when well, I look at the picture. One of the buildings he's talking about is going to be on the old footprint of the Sea Lab, and that doesn't even seem like a big enough footprint to hold that kind of structure. Maybe that's where he's talking about the hotel. I'm not sure. Yeah, the, the hotel in this diagram was on the on the on the actual corner of Hirondo and Harbor. Okay. But you're right. This 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 diagram in the paper actually doesn't even talk about the Sea Lab site or, or show a visual of what that might look like. That is a separate parcel uh, that came with his purchase, um, and that's a totally different project than than even what we saw in the papers. So, okay. um, so. Well and yeah. is there a portion of of it that is not aes that there's an edison distribution plant there that is going to be did we lose him no, no. Okay, sorry no. you moved to the middle of my screen i'm no. sorry that, that that is going to still be there that edison has something there that would stay regardless of whether the plant is operational or not no it's a good question so edison the only uh, the only infrastructure Edison has on that site right now is a switching station, right? So right. when you think about all the wires that are coming down one uh, ninetieth, uh, Hirondo, mm -hmm. Anita, right? Um, they there there's two different lines: uh, the the 240, uh, 220 or two forty kVs and the sixty six kV lines. Right. The, um, the 240s carry power out of the plant. So when it's generating, those are the ones that are taking power out to the grid. The 66 kVs power the plant itself, right, to, to help it run. And then and then there is some distribution from that switch yard to the local community. Um, we have already established that switch yard can go away. When the plant shuts down, um, Edison has actually told us they will remove, uh, and this is with the blessing of the property owner. So you need the property owner to be okay with this, um, but they can remove the switch yard and they can remove uh, the 66 and the 240 KV poles all the way up to prospect. Actually, the 240s can they can remove all the way out to the edge of our uh, of our town border, you know, just past Dominguez Park, and then what the city has been talking about uh with edison is 
how much would it cost and to remove the 66 KVs from Prospect to the edge of Dominguez Park. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the only component that Edison has on that property right now. Uh, the well, rest of it is all AES. So then, and I apologize, I keep coming up with questions. Um, who owns the the land that the Edison lines are on then? Because is that city land and would oh, that that's Edison land? And so is. we're yeah we we're we're in you know we're having these conversations with them because we would like to eventually right now they lease that land out to a lot of uh, you know nurseries. Uh, mm -hmm. We would like to be able to lease that land out and create you know park, uh, park. you know walking paths, biking paths, whatever, you know, really make it a, uh, a great public use. And so that's why we've started these conversations with them. Uh, but we kind of need the plant to close, you know, and the, the owner to be willing to shut down that switch yard for us to be able to even move in that direction. Um, the one thing you will see in a more immediate sense is the, um, the piece of land that goes from PCH down to Francisca uh edison is going to uh lease that to us and we are going to you know create some open space there uh in the coming years that that we do already have in progress is that the land that's under the king harbor sign that yep. that open field okay exactly yeah All right. yeah okay well i'm going to try and be quiet here but if nobody else has a question we'll just keep having a conversation with you no i think yeah. every i think other people have questions you've yeah yeah used no 40 gonna, minutes of time <laughs> No, no, we, we got plenty of time here, but but you know that this this is fully loaded, and I figured we would do that. So I just I just took advantage of the question to to go off for a little bit. But go ahead, Mary. Okay. Um, no, so I I wrote it in the chat, but Shannon, you know, you said that you live in Todd Lowenstein's district. I highly recommend, you know, you kind of saying when you said to us here that you would support a compromise. I think he needs to hear that from you and from the other constituents of his because they need to hear it from you guys. You know, we are in North Redondo. They don't care about our opinion. They don't listen to what we, what we, you know, what concerns us. But I think like you and your neighbors, if you get together and start, you know, sending him emails, go to his district meeting and verbalize, you know, um, your thoughts and concerns, I think it would go a long way, especially to say that you would be willing to compromise because right now that's, you know, not the messaging that necessarily is coming through, at least not from the very vocal people of South Redondo. So that's what I'd like to say about that. I think that would be helpful and go a long way. And second, I do want to remind everyone that we do have 3,100, 3,100 units coming to just North Redondo, of which 1,534 is going into District 4 alone. So, you know, this housing thing is really negatively impacting North Redondo a ton. And I know that, you know, with this recent article that was released that, you know, talks about the AES plant, people are all up in arms, but we should also be all up in arms because of, you know, the stress on our infrastructure in the North that we're going to have to suffer. because of these ridiculous housing numbers that we're having thrown at us. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thanks, thanks, Christian. Sure. All right, let me go, uh, I see, before we go to any other raised hands, uh, Noreen uh, has a comment in the chat here, uh, wants to know what is needed in order to get speed bumps on Meyer Lane. Uh, the street gets an enormous amount of traffic and it is a residential area. Much of that traffic moves way too fast. In addition, the new housing uh, projection for 300 units uh, on 190th between Meyer and Marianne is completely unworkable as far as traffic and parking. Um, so Noreen, what we can do uh, specific to that is, is what we do with any uh, speed bump request or speed hump request is uh, we uh, send me an email um, and uh, send that to horvath.rbd3 at gmail.com. And then I will forward that over to Public Works. Now, just be aware, we don't have a traffic engineer right now. Our traffic engineer uh, moved on to another uh, uh, another job. Uh, so our city engineer has kind of taken over those duties and we're trying to get uh, either some contract people or a new person in that position ASAP. Um, and, uh, and so 
this would just fall behind everything else that's already kind of in the queue and being worked on uh, in terms of traffic calming projects. Um, with that said, um, it's it's absolutely quite possible to be able to do it. They, we, it just needs to be evaluated. And, you know, luckily on Meyer, I, I don't know how this would work. Typically when we do speed humps in a neighborhood, we need a certain amount of residents uh, to support that. On Meyer, it's interesting because it's, it's very high density, right? And so you have a lot of those condo units um, and I don't know how that will work. Uh, in terms of getting support, or if it's like, do we need the support of the HOA, um, you know, for each unit uh, to to kind of weigh in on it. Um, the the best I know what will end up happening is if if it was something that they could do, it would have to be down on the flatter parts of Meyer. So Meyer becomes a hill right before it goes up to Ripley, and I know we wouldn't be able to put speed humps uh, on that uh, incline. Uh, at all, just because typically I think there's like a, a five percent grade. Uh, uh, they 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 don't put them on anything over a five percent grade. So, uh, but with that said, send me an email and uh, and then I will uh, forward that on and then keep you in the loop and see you know what what we can do to either have something happen down there or uh, or at least just explore it and see what is or is not feasible. Um, and also, with that said, if uh, if you feel like uh, some of the issues are speeding, because usually people want speed humps from a speeding perspective, I realize that Meyer does get a lot of flow just because of the amount of people that live on it. Um, but if it's a speeding issue too, we can also request uh, spot enforcement. Uh, and if you, you know, were able to say, hey, it's really during these particular times of day, then I can request that our traffic unit, um, you know, make that a, a priority. They, they, they circle through the city based on either our requests or, or things they notice and, uh, and just have them, you know, come out there uh, like, you know, a handful of times during a, a month to see if that will help maybe remind people to drive slower. Okay, that's helpful. Um, would it would it uh, also help to survey or provide a, a, a roster of the names of residents who would support such a um, a move? Yeah, that's always super helpful, right? And that's why I say, you know, what's interesting is, right? You know, you have all the different buildings and the HOAs, and so yes, if there if there is um, enough of a threshold of people saying, hey, we think this is a good idea to be studied or whatnot. I always think that's helpful, right? Because the last thing you want to do is, is go through the process of, of looking at it, studying it, and get to the end and find out that you just don't have enough support on the street to warrant mm. it. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think I can start a campaign locally for that. Um, can you also address this 300 plus units that are proposed for between Meyer and Marianne. Um, yeah, yeah, this is part of so the, going back, you know, that it's part of what I was addressing in uh, in the answer to Shannon's questions, right? The housing element uh, that was passed by three of my colleagues uh, is putting the vast majority of this uh, RENA allocation in North Redondo. And one of those areas they chose was was where you are uh, talking about. Um, now, you know, rezoning it and putting a residential overlay there does not necessarily mean it's going to happen although from the state's perspective they want you to rezone areas where it can happen right the whole point is to create um units mm -hmm. uh that area that that you're referring to is commercial and industrial right now and so you would need uh uh all those individuals to sell their properties right um uh, to somebody in order to effectuate some type of large project there uh and and that was one of the things the staff mentioned right was that you would need to consolidate all those properties to be able to create the amount of density that they are proposing to put there um, so you don't you don't see eminent domain taking over there no no the, no so the, the let, let's just be clear here the only time the city is going to use uh eminent domain, it, there, there, it is a very tricky and specific um, uh, protocol, you know, or, or strategy to use. The, the city will not be doing that because the city 
doesn't have the money to purchase those properties. You know, um, uh, here's an example of where the city will use eminent domain. Like we're trying to put a, a, a right hand turn lane on aviation going northbound at Artesia, right? Um, the, the owner of the property will not uh, sell us the, the 10 or 12 feet that we need uh, of his gas station to, to make that happen, even though we have offered fair market value and had appraisals, whatnot. Mm. That's a situation where the city would uh, approach an eminent domain because there is a, um, there is a greater value to the greater public, right? Purchasing, uh, while I, I guess we could argue that, hey, creating more affordable units would be a greater value to the public, the city is in no position to be able to make that happen. And so, no, we would not be doing eminent domain in that, okay. in that area. We need, all right. But what needs to happen there is those all those businesses would need to say, hey, we, we are willing to sell, and there would need to be somebody coming in that is aggregating those properties. And mm -hmm. I don't know that that is even a possibility or, or is something that could happen. So, okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, other questions? So AES just sucked all the air out of this room is what you're telling me. <laughs> Uh, yes, James. Uh, just unmute yourself, sir. You can't read my lips. <laughs> well, I <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> uh, um, there was mention that that Bill Brand was trying to do some kind of legal action to reverse this mandate from the legislature that they can take over all our local zoning. Is anything going on with that? Uh, so I think what you're referring to is that Mayor Brand, along with um, uh, some elected officials from other jurisdictions throughout the state, were putting together a, 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 a statewide ballot initiative. Uh, and um, they were struggling to, my understanding is they were struggling to raise money uh, to be able to hire signature gatherers because you know, I mean, you guys have been to the store enough times where the person's running at you with the, you know, multiple things and asking you to sign something. It costs a lot of money to hire those people to get signatures. Uh, and the only way to qualify for a, a statewide ballot initiative is to gather a certain threshold of signatures. Um, so they, they shut down that campaign uh, sometime, yeah, I don't want to say in like February or March. Uh, and, uh, and they said that they were going to try to resurrect it again, uh, you know, prior to, uh, the statewide, uh, general in 2024. Um, that doesn't mean that people still aren't trying to push back against Sacramento, right? Each of us, you know, I wrote an op-ed about this last year, um, in the LA times, um, I, I mean, people throughout the state are are really pushing back on this eradication of of local control, as we would call it, right? The ability to determine your own stuff. So, uh, but I think specific to your question, that effort is either stalled or halted. I'm, I'm not really sure because I'm not involved in that. Does that help? Yes. The now, <clears throat> excuse me. The, the latest allocation of where all this new housing has to go, according to districts, is that pretty much stayed the same in the last six months? Because I've, I mean, they're, I've always argued that South Redondo, they have no places to put anything. But you go down Catalina, and there's several stretches of businesses that some of them aren't even open behind where the uh, the pier is that could be housing. And it's a housing district and it's on Catalina. There's lots of street. Um, so we're still forcing everything up in North Redondo or because uh, uh, we tried to push back here and I don't know what the state accepted. Well, so the state hasn't um, approved our housing element yet, right? We're, I think, on the fourth or fifth try. Um, I voted no on, on all of the iterations thus far, uh, as has Councilwoman MD. Um, and I guess we were right, you know, because they're not approving it. So um, with that said, my colleagues are not uh, entertaining the idea of, of shifting those numbers more equitably throughout the city. Uh, they've taken a pretty hard stance on that. 
Uh, and I don't anticipate that they are going to change their perspective. You know, now that, I think that's why Miriam was, you know, advocating with Shannon earlier that, hey, maybe, um, you know, residents in South Redondo who are more pragmatic and willing to compromise, you know, if, if they have that uh, perspective, they, they need to communicate to their representatives uh, those thoughts. Um, the, you know, the council member in District 4 had uh, hundreds of people advocating for that, and, and he did not uh, listen to their thoughts. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I think the con we should continue to have the conversation and we should continue to uh, push representatives to make those changes. I don't know, right now we have submitted our, our most recent round as of July, I believe it was. Um, uh, Councilwoman MD was not at that meeting. I voted no, uh, so it was a three to one. Um, and now we're waiting for the next round of comments from uh, the state housing community development department to see what's going to happen. Um, they could approve it. They could not approve it. I, I just don't know at this point in time. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Marita. Hi. Um, my question was a little bit similar to James's question. Um, so basically what you're saying is that the proposal that they had submitted prior they just basically resubmitted the same proposal for the state um housing arena they didn't make any changes correct or very minor they they, they made i think w what i would say is they made like minor changes right so the state came back with comments and the staff is trying to address their comments you know uh in in some way shape or form i I think like they're they're just kind of jumping, you know, in my opinion, they're just jumping through hoops to try to meet these obligations. It's it's really a matter of does HCD see that as being a sincere uh, and uh, approach towards towards meeting uh, the the issues that were uh, were presented to us or not? Um, clearly, you know, even in the other iterations that have happened since last May when it was passed the first time. Um, you know, HCD keeps coming back with with more concerns. So uh, I, I don't know. You know, I, I, this this whole thing is just so bizarre and and messy. Um, but no, I, I the simple answer is the vast majority of the housing is still in North Redondo, uh, and they've added in a couple things in North in South Redondo that are really minor. Um, I think maybe the, the potential permanent supportive housing site in South Redondo, they're going to give us some credit for that, but, uh, but no, we still have taken, you know, 90% uh, of the, uh, of the allocation in North Redondo. Do we still like, I know last time we had written a letter, um, and got a hundred and I think 20 or 150 signatures from North Redondo residents and sent it to Robin Huntley. Is that still a possibility to have an effect on it? I, well, so you and your neighbors that, that sent those letters, you can continue to send other letters uh, based on um, based on whatever was, you know, changed or altered in this most recent version in July, and, uh, and you can continue to advocate for your positions. Just know that when these letter, when the comments come back from HCD, they acknowledge that, hey, we received you know, letters from X, Y, and Z, or, you know, from a group of, you know, in your case, right, a group of people, uh, you know, related to this, and here are the concerns we have based on that information. So, uh, so they, they clearly do have an effect, and the staff at HCD does review them um, uh, and, and consider them as a part of their process. Um, now, just out of curiosity, because I think we would like to write another set of letters, um what like specific changes i know we had mentioned like in our letters because i know with with the arena it's not like you can mention our schools are going to be overcrowded this and that i know specifically it's related to the housing and one of our biggest things is that you're going to put 90 percent in one area and that's not fair and equitable they'll just ration two for the new residents coming to the city it's like let's just um what were some of the things that um when the state wrote back to redondo what changes have Redondo made or what is what are some things that they're requiring? I just want to see. Um, I, I haven't been keeping up in it. I'm sorry. We were really good about it for a while and then it kind of fell off the back burner. Now it's getting rehashed again. Yeah. Um, 
I, I will be honest with you in this particular moment right now, I wouldn't even be able to, to like give you as it, 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 it gets so complicated as to what they are asking for. I'd have to go back and review everything again. And uh, so if you email me, I can try to get you some specific answers about that. Uh, but I don't off the top of my head. Um, I don't recall, you know, I, I definitely, um, I still think there was that that whole affordability and equi uh, you know, uh, issue that was um, that was brought up, but um, but yeah, I, I don't I don't remember exactly what their their finer points were. They've had so many different concerns, you know, over these iterations um, that I, you start to lose sight. It's like sometimes when we talk about like the lawsuits that the city has been in, you start to mix and mash everything together because you know you just there's so much information coming at you uh, as a council person. So if you want, email me after the meeting, and then I will uh, I'll try to pull together some information for you. Okay. Marita, is there a way we can get on your email or list or something? Because like a lot of us would love to sign that. Like I, I'll sign it and write a letter as well and, and do whatever for that housing to Robin. Yeah. You know what? I realized recently um, one of my neighbors commented that there was a post on Nextdoor that was going around. And I was actually thinking, I know it was a week old, but I was just thinking of like actually commenting on there. Um, and putting it out there more to the community, but I can put my email in the chat as well. And if you can spread it to your neighbors, because last Thank time you. we kind of just, we just did basically like people we knew and friends of friends and it was informal and we were able to whip up signatures like that. We didn't have a lot of time. So yeah. we really weren't able to reach out as much as we wanted, but I'd love to send a letter that has even more than the 120, 150 we got last time and just really, show north redondo's concern for this issue that we know the housing's coming we you know it's it is what it is and that you know redondo needs to accept that but that it should be we have two zip codes that it should be distributed equitably instead of just all 90 percent one area um so i'll put my um Oop, we lost you there you go you're muted now <laughs> you muted yourself marita okay i don't know how i did that <laughs> Um, I'll put my address in the chat and then I'm going to as well reply to that post from last week. Um, you know, it's funny because we were aware of it um, just, you know, within the past couple of months. And then when we were telling people in this area about it, people weren't aware. And it just, I feel like North Redondo is really going to feel a little um, blindsided uh, because I don't think a lot of residents are really aware of this. And I think this could be a big um, issue on the recall for um, Obaji since he didn't support his area. Um, and yeah. <laughs> um, oh, and just uh, if you had to say, just with um, Christian, just with the little changes that you've known that have been made to the most recent proposal, do you think the likelihood of getting accepted is good, fair, not good, in your opinion? You know, I, I had a private conversation with. Uh, a staff member where before the July one, uh, where they thought it was going to pass, you know, the HCD was going to approve us the last time based on their conversations. And then they were super disappointed when, you know, HCD said, no, we're, we're going through another round here. So I don't know, people hear what they want to hear sometimes. And so because I'm not directly engaged in these conversations, it's hard for me to um, to ascertain like which way it's going. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, like Councilwoman MD uh, has always spent more time on the housing uh, conversations than myself. I've, I've always focused more on homelessness and transportation and a couple other areas. And so, uh, and even though I have gone and, and uh, provided testimony in this conversation to SCAG, uh, uh multiple times i it's just it's not as much my wheelhouse as it is hers uh so uh you know sh she and i sometimes rely on each other to help get the other one up to speed in areas where we've decided to apply more of our focused time um yeah i i'm not sure uh i i, I just don't have a good sense of of what is happening and i i think because 
in some cases, HCD also, you know, they're trying to, I'm not making excuses for them, but they're trying to like wrap their heads around at a state level, all these new laws and stuff that's required of them, right? And so uh, I think it, it just becomes confusing for them as a, as a kind of a, a governing body in this area, as much as it is confusing for municipalities to figure out what is compliant or not compliant. So, um, and I think too, whether, you know, the housing element gets approved or is not approved, I think, you know, this is also going to be an area of litigation for years to come because people really are, um, people just are on very different sides of this conversation and, uh, and it's not 100% clear as to how, how does all of this, you know, come to fruition and how does it work and, and is it right, you know, so uh, it's going to be messy for a while here. Um, I, you know, let me just go back to the comment I made uh, to uh, Noreen a couple minutes ago too, right? Zoning is one thing and zoning, you know, the, the, the biggest problem I think with upzoning an area is that, you know, it's harder to undo an upzoning and uh, then, it, you know, so, but just because we allocate, you know, numbers or do these residential overlays doesn't mean it's going to happen, right? You you still need somebody that's willing to buy the parcels, do the investment and the time. And, and let's face it, Redondo is not exactly the easiest city to work with, you know, when it comes to building anything, you know, and that's why we're kind of stuck in the 70s, 80s right now with what you see around town. So I don't know. I don't think that answered your question, but but it's the best I can give you at this point. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> All right, Yvonne. Yvonne, if you can hear me. Can you hear me now? now? Yes, now I can hear you. Sorry about that. Good morning and uh, thank you for your information. I okay. am from District 4 okay. and District 2 and I appreciate coming to your meetings. There are things that I gather I go to everybody's meeting, or at least I try to, most importantly now, and I put that in your chat too, everyone's gone Zoom, so it's an opportunity to go in and hear each district, and you explain the AES very well. I'm not saying your constituents aren't, you know, as good, but the explanation, I understand your level, which is great. I appreciate that. I'm not going to ask you about the recall, but I am going to ask you about measure e okay uh coming up in the vote in october yeah um your your side your take on it uh vote no uh, it's really yeah, simple. yeah. I, so the city uh the, the the fast and easy answer is vote no and the reason why th th this is no different than our conversation about like the housing stuff right this ballot initiative takes away the city's local control right it, it basically you should never govern by ballot initiatives right because the only way to undo choices uh that are made at the ballot is to have another ballot initiative right and so the city has taken a multi-year process to look at uh you know how do we comply with prop 64 and how do we allow or disallow um, retail cannabis in the city um and uh and so what we have put together and the ordinance that we we just passed the first reading the second reading will be on september 6th um i think is extremely thoughtful and that was what was most important to me right in thinking about the city how do we approach cannabis uh considering um, our local zoning, our public safety, and our public health, right? And so everybody that came to the table as a part of that, you know, city manager's uh, working group came from all these entities, right? We had PD, we had uh, the Beach City Health District, we had our community development. We had people from the cannabis industry as a part of that as well, um, who are residents. So I think what we've crafted and what we are willing to allow, which is two potential retail locations and delivery emanating from those locations, 
serves the needs and the the overall the overarching desires of what prop 64 you know was kind of intended to do um what measure e is it's crafted and written by um by an outside company right so we we'll call them a special interest right but they they have written an initiative that benefits them right so uh and it doesn't it it provides zero flexibility for the city when a city passes its own ordinance we have the ability or a future council has the ability to make changes on the spot as they see needed right so if say two locations was too many the city could by ordinance change that you know if you vote in something by initiative you'd have to put another ballot initiative on to make a change so uh, i'm a hard no on measure e and uh, and I would advise everybody to uh, to fill out that October nineteenth ballot as such. Appreciate it, and thank you for letting me speak. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely, Marty. Um, hi, I'm sorry to kind of go back here and rehash what you've already been discussing, but I just want to make sure that I clarify from my understanding with um, the housing issue. The other, I know there's, you know, one of the problems is the number, of course, and equitable distribution. But what about with the affordable housing? I remember a meeting with um, Laura MD several months ago where one of the issues was that the percent of affordable housing was not only primarily in North Redondo, but also specifically in the region that one would call, um, and I quote, the lower income part and the more, di you know, ethnically diverse part of Redondo Beach which would go against the state as far as i guess whatever it is that their their guidelines are correct um for placing affordable housing has that been addressed at all or is that still I, an issue i i believe that that's still one of the concerns that has come back but uh again i just i just need to go back and like reread through uh the stuff to see like is that still um you know a a matter of high importance from hcd's perspective or not uh but but I, I think that was an argument that we made. Uh, I think that was an argument that you and your neighbors made in your letter. So um, yeah, I, I just need to check on on where HCD is in terms of their evaluation of that argument. Okay. And as far as I understand, so when it comes to parking and traffic and even overcrowding of schools, I absolutely it's beyond my imagination as to why those factors are not considered. But is that something that the city would be responsible for? If the state says that we must play, place housing, for example, in that region on 190th, that is, I think primarily Marianne looks like it would take the bulk of it. I'm looking at your map here that you had. Oh, you can't see it. Anyway, forget it. So you can't see it online. But um, that area, for example, on Marianne, it only lets out to 190th with mm -hmm. no light there or onto Fisk Lane, which is a tiny street with parking on only one side yep. that immediately ends and turns into high. Also, Amy, where we are, um, all of those, I think if it's zoned for R3, all of that housing there, not only would it be a nightmare for parking, which doesn't exist and traffic, but Washington is already the most overcrowded elementary school with over 800 kids in Redondo Beach. I don't understand how, wh why are those issues that cannot be addressed and how could we incorporate that into our letters and our arguments and safety? I mean, the safety for the children, their education, the safety for traffic. So can safety be another way to look at it? Maybe a, a better word to use rather than parking and traffic and overcrowding of schools? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. And I don't know if, if it's one of the parameters. I, I don't think it is actually one of the parameters that HCD looks at um, when, when they're evaluating it. And, you know, and maybe they should. And, and the state should take a more holistic approach to how they evaluate different cities. Because like I said earlier, every city is different. So to the point you're making, you know, if you were to put that many units there, you would probably need to add a signal uh at marianne right and right now we just have a, a crosswalk signal right by the um by the um trailer park um but that's but correct you're, you're absolutely right like you know and then you know a traffic engineer would probably say something like well but we have that signal at anza right like it, 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 so these are the unintended consequences of of not programming or thinking about zoning in a more global perspective right um 
uh, you don't necessarily want all that uh, all those cars feeding out into the Fisk High because then they still have to then circle around what to Meyer or you know out to Ripley you know like it it doesn't necessarily make sense uh, so yeah the there there are complications uh, that would happen for any particular um, development uh, anywhere and that would have to be considered from the school perspective you know I don't know if uh if the school district has weighed in on this conversation um and you know you could always petition dr keller and the board members that you know they should now the school district i just want to say they do pay very close attention to any projects that are in the process of happening right or that are coming before the city they're, they're always paying attention to that because they are looking at hey what can we or can we not absorb in any one given area um you know they are they do have other sites uh you know like and i, I don't know I'm, I'm i'm making assumptions here right but they could argue that well hey if we needed another elementary school to pull the load off of washington we have the you know the old school site on earl that right now is being uh you know leased out to um uh christian coast or, or I, I forget which which one it is um, right, and that they could always take back that site as a as an elementary school to to um, to take burden off of Washington. Doesn't take the burden off of Adams though, right? And it doesn't take the burden off of RUHS. So, um, so I would, uh, you know, what I would recommend is that if uh, you know part of what you're doing really is that concern about how to how does it affect schools is to bring the school district into the conversation and see if they are also willing to weigh in uh, with HCD on this uh, because they have a much more intimate understanding of what they can or cannot do than I do. Uh, does that help? It does. And I'm actually a little bit surprised or shocked. Um, I'm sorry, I'm at work. So sorry about the traffic. Oh, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what was I saying? I, I'm a little shocked that the school district isn't part of the council meetings, I guess is what I'm hearing, that they don't normally, does the city not think or the mayor not think that it's important to always discuss housing issues and these types of issues with the entire school district? Well, I mean, wow. uh, the that's not that they're not invited to, right? It's just whether they they choose to engage or not. You know, clearly when when they feel strongly about something, they will either have a board member show up at a meeting or they will send a letter um but you know in in some ways uh and i am just making an assumption here uh these conversations we're having are kind of in the ether right they're not necessarily as tangible as saying hey there are 300 units absolutely coming to the galleria right so that they are engaged when a project is in process of happening and there is a developer who is talking with the school district here we're just talking about you know the idea of zoning for the possibility of something and it's quite possible in their minds that they don't feel that that is uh something they need to weigh in on at this time because it's not affecting them yet right it's a it's a future problem i don't know uh, you know and that's why i would say it's best to contact your board member your school board members and or dr keller and have a conversation with them about it um and i you know i'd be happy to talk with them about it too to understand what is their perspective but uh they have not shared one with me uh yeah i think that would be fantastic if you can assist by sure. discussing it with dr keller i mean let's not deal with the problem once it arises it's best to avoid it right yeah fair enough in theory okay thank you yeah you're more than welcome all right any other questions before i go to the chat because I see it's a busy chat and I'll try to see if there's questions in there. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. All right, not seeing any new hands raised. So let's see what we got in here. Uh, all right, uh, Kelly asks, do you know when they are gonna pave Earl and the courts? Uh, let me see if it's on. Uh, looks like, um, Margaret, okay, um, Councilwoman MD has on her website a uh, a great little um, a blog post with like uh, information uh, about this that she put up there. Earl Margaret Court 
is being done in 2025. Uh, Earl Street to Glick, 2026. Fisher Court, 2026. Uh, Ringe to Earl, 2027. Earl Street, Glick to Hall, 2027. Earl Court, 2029. So they are, it looks like they're in the, in the next, in the upcoming years. Um, not in our current plan, but they, they, we are clearly already planning them for the out years. So I uh, hope that answers that question, Kelly. Um, all right. Uh, Laura, haven't kept up with the construction at PCH and Palos Verdes Boulevard. What is going on? Okay, Laura, you're talking about the uh, Legato. Um, I drive past it every day on my way to work and my way home from work. Um, they've started construction. Uh, it looks like they've shelled out the hotel. Um, my understanding is, is that they've gotten the parking structures built, uh, the underground parking structures, um, and they are just now starting to, uh, to go up. Um, I mean, they haven't like started framing or anything, but, uh, but they are now kind of starting that above ground process. So there's still a lot of soil movement from what I can see. Um, I haven't seen any construction starting on the hotel itself, minus the, uh, you know, the kind of demo. Um, but, but it is in progress and I believe it's slated to be done sometime in the next 18 months, I think. Don't quote me on that, but I, I think that is, uh, is their calendar. Um, uh, Kelly, if South Redondo refuses to work with North Redondo, can't North Redondo vote to break away from South Redondo and become its own city or join Hermosa? <clears throat> Why would we join Hermosa? Why wouldn't Hermosa join North Redondo? That's what I would ask, Kelly. So um, I'm just saying. Uh, I, so is that a possibility? Um, well, I guess anything is, is a possibility, right? I mean, North Redondo has an enormous amount of uh, the city's tax base. Um, that is a conversation for residents to pursue if it was something they collectively wanted. You know, I think, you know, we have heard over and over again that the North is treated differently than the South, right? Um, and, uh, and that is, that is not like a new thing. Like I heard it when I was knocking on doors, you know, uh, in 2015, um and and it seems like that is a a a decades old uh narrative and and thought process um with that said you know i've pointed out here that the harbor uh the pier the harbor aes it always seems to suck all all the energy and uh and conversation out of a room right it, there's always a lot of focus on that and one thing that I know I've tried to do and Councilwoman Emdy has tried to do is, is shift that focus back to Artesia and other aspects of North Redondo. And it takes time. And that's, that's you know, the one thing I think a lot of people forget. The government moves slow. It moves slow for a reason because it has to be done in a transparent manner um, and the, there has to be public input. And it just takes time. Um, you know, when we think about it, uh, my budget motion from 2017 you know, had like, hey, let's add on to the general plan, the Artesia Aviation Corridor Area Plan, right? Well, you know, that's a multi-year process, right? So now, you know, we just kind of passed the ACAP in the past year and we're, you know, like all these things happen, you know, a, a lot of things that I've either worked on or started or they're not going to come to fruition until I'm out of office. Um, you know, but the, the point was, was that we wanted to bring attention back to North Redondo and we've started that process and it's it's going, uh, but it's going to take a while for it to, to happen. And and I think North Redondo has not been as vocal as South Redondo, you know, historically. Uh, they, they don't vote as much as South Redondo does. Uh, so, you know, when we want to see change, you have to show up at the ballot box. And you have to uh, you have to show up at a council meeting. You know, a lot of times at council meetings, we have the same three people over and over again. They are from South Redondo, you know, and uh, I, I'm not trying to say that, you know, uh, you have to participate. And I know everybody's busy. I get it. Like, 
Um, it's, it's one of the most challenging things is that we all have lives. We all work, we have kids, you know, um, it is hard to pay attention. That's why you pay me the big bucks to do this for you, to pay attention. Uh, and I'm joking there, there's really no big bucks in this job, but, uh, but that's, that's the whole point is right. My job, my job is to try to hear what is being said and, and represent everybody, you know, regardless of opinions, as I said earlier, because everybody has a different opinion, um, and then do what's in the best interest of the city. So um so if that was something north redondo residents wanted to do you could always approach it that would probably have to be a ballot initiative and then you know it, it, it's complicated because you'd have to create a whole new city you know with a whole new staff and you know it's uh that would not be an easy undertaking let's put it that way so um all right uh shannon agrees it should be equitable uh Yes, I agree, Shannon. We should create a group of residents across the border lines. That would be wonderful. Um, do, do, do. All right. Those are. Okay. All right. What is the tax percentage difference between North and South Redondo? I don't know that off the top of my head but I can try to find that out, uh, Kelly, and get back to you. Um, okay, uh, Tanya. Hey, good morning. I just wanted to see if you could clarify one more time. We're talking about Measure E. Yeah. No on Measure E, but I don't want people to feel like, because I've heard other council people say, just vote no on Canvas. It's not that simple. We're going to get it either way, correct? And then, so talk about that and also the tax implications between the two, um, if you're if you if you know the difference um, between your what the city is proposing and then what Measure E is proposing. Do you, what is the the tax implications between the two? Okay, Measure E has no um, no taxes built into it at all. Right, it's uh, it's just the the special interest, you know, three three retail locations and only three, um, no delivery. Uh, it's yeah, I mean, it's mostly written to benefit uh, the the people who have have put it forward uh, and are putting it on the ballot. Uh, but there is no sales tax as a result of Measure E. So um, I, as I said earlier, vote no on Measure E because the city has already undertaken a path forward and to the point you just made there will be retail cannabis regardless um, but with the city's ordinance there will only be two locations um, and the two locations uh, you can they can't be in the same district uh, so they have to be spread out you know one of the things when i did a poll about this over a year ago uh, people said put one in the north put one in the south um uh so see it's all about equity right um uh now the city we are planning or we have had you know very limited conversation but i think one of our goals is to put on the march municipal uh, election a initiative to create a uh, a sales tax specific to cannabis um and that we would put on on the march ballot um so measure e does not account for that but we will uh, account for that. Also, in the meantime, before we put a measure forward uh, to create uh, or generate sales tax on cannabis, we are, as part of our ordinance, um, we will still be able to generate uh, monies that would go into the general fund, also something that is not part of Measure E, um, by creating a, uh, uh, it's, it's not a sales tax, but it's a developer's agreement. And so there would be revenues that are coming into the city. Um, our ordinance also has a lot of public safety uh, things built into it that are required of any potential uh, cannabis shops. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we really tried to consider all the major important touch points or things that would be concerning to, to residents ahead of time in our ordinance. Their, ordin their uh, initiative does not do any of that. Does that answer your question? Yep. Okay. Uh, Miriam? 
I thank you. So, you know, thanks for answering that question because I actually didn't know that there would be no tax revenue with Measure E versus if we allow the city to do, you know, our own ordinance. So that was really helpful. Thank you. And it really just makes me upset even more, just as a comment, that the council people that voted to, you know, put the Obaji recall election paired with the cannabis ordinance solely so that they could create voter confusion so that way people will be so confused not vote and they they paired it together just so that they could do that so they could put obaji's election early costing what two hundred and ninety thousand dollars instead of waiting a few weeks for it to be on november 8th and they're literally willing to hurt our city hurt pay a ton of money for the special election to put a this measure e that if it passes is not going to be of any benefit to us residents whatsoever if we can't get any tax dollars off of it solely to keep this guy in his council seat it's disgusting and i hope that everyone on here from district four does vote yes to recall him and please tell your friends because that's a bunch of crap i'm sorry i'm so pissed off right now thank you well, it's it's okay to be angry, uh, and you know I did not support uh, this special election. I, I thought it should have gone on the November eighth ballot uh, because it would have only cost thirty six thousand dollars, and uh, this uh, ballot initiative, the council had unanimously agreed to put it on the March ballot, um, and that would have given us a good you know six month jump on having our ordinance in place and selecting potential people like you know there, there was a lot of thought put behind why that uh you know that was really going to work in our benefit uh so yes you know just abruptly you know choosing to move this ballot initiative up to be able to put a, a recall election on a special day and on a wednesday it um, I, I don't agree with it and anybody who's on my mailing list is if you've clicked and watched, you can see my comments on that on YouTube uh, as to, you know, I, I was disgusted with it as well. It was, um, I, I, I'm not happy with a lot of the recent decisions made by my colleagues, uh, unfortunately. I don't think they've really taken uh, to heart the best interests of our cities, uh, especially when the, those colleagues initially invited the special interest group in by taking their, uh, their large donations uh, after their elections uh, in uh, in 2021. So, um, so I think there's a lot more going on than than I am aware of, or or the public is aware of. And I guess we'll we'll see how that plays out. Um, all right, James, what's going on with the route for the extended Green Line? Uh, so, uh, Metro had meetings uh, in the past couple of weeks. Uh, they did one at Adams Middle School. They did one uh, in Lawndale, one in Torrance, and then one. Uh, on Zoom uh, to talk about like where they're at in this process for their uh, environmental impact report stage. Uh, they are anticipating that the draft EIR, uh, which is studying two routes, will come out in January, sometime in January, uh, and then uh, sometime next summer, uh, probably, uh, you know, the Metro Board would uh, have a final EIR before them. So, what does this mean for residents? Um, right now, they have narrowed it down to uh, to pretty much what uh, my 2018 letter to Metro requested, uh, which was, uh, and, and that the council then adopted uh, about a month or two later. Um, they are studying Hawthorne Boulevard uh, as a route uh, in a elevated alignment. Um, uh, and then they are also studying the existing right of way in a trenched alignment and and it's trenched, but it does have a couple times where it has to come up so like it's trenched through Lawndale. it comes up over Artesia because the that's where the uh, the tr the um, the overpass is existing right now, and then it would go back down trenched. Um, uh, under 182nd and then come back up again to go up over 190th on its way to the Torrance uh, site. Um, they, if you go, I think on their website, they actually, they were showing a video at the, uh, 
at the uh, the town hall that they they hosted that kind of shows what what are these uh, alignments look like so you can you know it's it's computer generated um, but it, it gives you at least a decent idea of hey what what does that look like um, and I recommend anybody look at it uh, you know there's still when the draft EIR comes out, then there will be a public comment period like any EIR has, and then people can, you know, uh, weigh in on that. Ultimately, the, the final decision uh, related to this is in the hands of uh, the Metro board members. So, uh, you know, I, I spend my time uh, talking with either board members or with their, um, their transportation deputies, mostly with their transportation deputies. Um, and, uh, you know, right now the city of Torrance and the city of Redondo are not necessarily on the same page, uh, with which alignment they would prefer. Um, the city of Torrance would prefer the right of way alignment and the city of Redondo would prefer the Hawthorne alignment. Um, so this is. I, I'm not necessarily a point of contention, but it, it's uh, a, it's a discussion at, for me, an ongoing discussion with my colleagues in Torrance to see if there's any willingness to shift their perspective. Uh, Lawndale is uh, and has been against uh, the sea line extension in any way, shape, or form, uh, and uh, so, but it's it's coming either way. Um, so we will see what happens uh, when the EIR comes out. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Um, okay. Uh, Kelly, I don't know that tax profits are more important than suicides or mental health, you know, regarding uh, cannabis. Um, I think, uh, you know, as with everything right there, there are more complications to this and there uh there are a high percentage of people that support uh cannabis and the the sales and or delivery of cannabis which is why prop 64 passed actually the fact it passed so overwhelmingly in the beach cities that's why the outside special interests have put together these ballot initiatives in redondo hermosa Manhattan and El Segundo uh, because of the way the general public voted on Prop 64. Uh, so they, I think, made an assumption that, hey, these were going to be easy targeted cities to to get what they want. Um, and and unfortunately for the other beach cities, uh, you know, they were kind of late to the game. Redondo was at least, uh, you know, it was important to me to be proactive. And so by the time this ballot initiative came, we were already well ahead of the game and having thought about it uh, and having had our committee uh, come to us with recommendations for what to do regarding our own ordinance. Tanya. Is there anything new that has come up from all of the surveys that went out and all of the input from the community about the peer? Is, you know, is there a summary? Are they moving forward on anything that was proposed? Like, where is all that at? Um, can you clarify? Are you talking like the the water, like the King Harbor amenities plan? Yes, yes. Um, so uh, the last we we did it. I did a community meeting on this two meetings ago um, with our waterfront and economic development director. So anybody who wants to kind of get a, a little bit. Uh, better idea of what's happening you know that that is up on my website and on youtube and whatnot uh, you can go watch that but to your point i believe um they're supposed to be coming back to the council like sometime in september with uh you know the results of all the work they've done over the past year um i don't know if that's the plan i'll have to ask staff but that was the original goal was that you know sometime in September they were going to come back and you know we were going to start the next step of that King Harbor amenities plan process. Um, so I guess by the time I have my community meeting uh, in September, we can uh, we can readdress that and I'll, I'll also try to get an answer from staff as to what's our calendar on that. And just for clarity, anything that was proposed that gets put into this plan and gets approved, how is it supposed to be paid for? Well, that that is the complication uh, with with that. So, 
whether you supported uh, the Center Cal project or not, you know, doesn't matter, right, at this point in time. Um, the point of that multi-year process, which started in 2003 and went all the way until Center Cal's, uh, until the project was proposed and, and voted on by the council in 2016 uh, and, and early 2017, um, that project was specifically designed to be what we call a private public partnership um, where the private entity would carry the bulk of the investment costs and the city would carry a small amount so in, in that perspective they were going to be paying you know like 150 to 250 million uh, and the city was going to probably do about a 25 million dollar investment um, now uh, you know with the king harbor amenities plan the city will have to do all of the uh, investments on our own with uh, the possibility of uh, uh, maybe outside grants. So like, you know, the state gave us $10 million for Seaside Lagoon last year. Well, that's great, that, that's, that's nice, uh, but the eventual redo of Seaside Lagoon is probably gonna cost 25 to $50 million. I mean, the, the estimated costs back in, when Measure C passed were like, you know, in the 20 million, 20 to $25 million range. So uh so yeah costs just so everybody knows like public infrastructure costs just go up exponentially every year it's so it's super important to make your public infrastructure investments sooner than later always um because it's only going to get worse so yeah the city's going to have to find additional monies uh whether that is from the general fund or from our harbor enterprise funds uh, uh, you know, I've heard some of my colleagues now start talking about bonding to do stuff. Well, that's no different than taxes, you know, uh, and I remember, you know, the Measure C conversation, they said, you don't need any new taxes to do stuff. Well, you know, we're going to see what happens now, you know, so public amenities, great, but it does come with an enormous amount of investment upfront. And then it also comes with an enormous amount of uh, maintenance and operations costs in the out years. Um, so uh, we will see. I don't know, uh, you know, where we're at right now, but that's that's also going to be a part of this process, right? When they come back and they talk about the whole King Harbor amenities plan and what you know the public has a, a taste for, you know, and and by the way, it's the public who participated in this process, right? It's not necessarily uh, reflective of all 70,000 residents, it's just those who decided to engage, uh, then we'll be able to create some type of map going forward and see what, you know, what's the low hanging fruit? Um, what are the more complicated discussions? Uh, you know, putting a boat ramp in, you know, that's going to be complicated. Uh, we can probably get grants from uh, the Department of Boating and Waterways. Um, but you know some of the stuff i saw during those meetings made no sense to me you know like uh just the way that they were going to move traffic into the boat ramp and stuff so uh there's a lot more conversations to be had uh most of them will probably happen after i've left council uh you know so if i get a chance to weigh in now i'll, I'll provide my perspective but um it's probably going to be someone else's problem down the line and since uh, yeah. Thank you for that. And since they didn't seem to support the revitalization of the pier, do you think that it's possible that we could do some type of public private partnership for North Redondo? Because I think our community would enjoy something like that. Well, I, I mean, that is always a possibility, right? Um, one of the things I talked about when we were having the uh, Artesia Aviation uh, Corridor Area Plan uh, discussions was that um, it was it was primarily focused on Artesia proper and our aviation proper. And in my mind, I thought that the the conversation should expand out to uh, Matthews on the north side and uh, Vanderbilt on the south side of Artesia, uh, because for anybody to come like right now, Artesia is kind of piecemeal, right? Um, and you know uh, we have a lot of people that own buildings that don't live in the community you know 
Um, and that's why there's, you know, usually a lot of complaints about why isn't it being kept up or taken care of, or, you know, the investment is coming from those who are renting the buildings. And we've tried to, you know, we created programs to try to help incentivize um, investment into those properties. Um, but, you know, a private public partnership usually has to have some amount of scale to it. Um, and for somebody to come in and make an investment, you know, I think they would need to, to be able to, in my opinion, like buy up an entire block, you know, going back from Artesia to Vanderbilt, say, and, you know, between X Street and Y Street uh, and create something that was commercial and, and residential. And, you know, again, it all, it all comes back to people who are wanting to make investments, they have to have a return on that investment. And so it gets complicated as to how they uh, hit that threshold. Um, so I don't know, is there a possibility? Sure. Um, how would that come about? I, I don't know. So um, you have to have people that are interested in wanting to make investments and you have to have underlying um, zoning and rules that, that allows them to see the potential. You know, so one of the conversations we keep having is how do we lower the parking requirements for, uh, for Artesia? Because right now they're onerous. You know, there's people that are interested in certain parcels, but for them to be able to make the investment there, they have to be able to effectuate X amount of parking. And that, is not necessarily easily done with the current rules we have. So um, I think the city is trying to rethink uh, how we approach that. We're having conversations about it and we will just have to see how does this groundwork, this foundational work we're doing now, how does it play out in the years to come uh, in terms of uh, people wanting to, the private sector wanting to make investments into the corridor and or bring their businesses there. Um, you know, it, you, you need the city to work hand in hand with that. And I think our new economic development director, um, you know, he may uh, really, he, he comes with a, a community development background. He may be the right person to help jumpstart uh, that conversation. Uh, and then we need, you know, uh, the residents to to also be a part again be a part of that conversation and you know talk about what they want you know um, over the years people have told me they want to have that same experiential uh, relationship with Artesia uh, that people in South Redondo have with the village right they want to be able to walk to restaurants and 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 whatever uh, and so you know to do that we need to make our, our neighborhoods and Artesia walkable, bikeable, um, you know, inviting so that people actually engage with it in the way that they, they desire. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay. Well, we are past 11. I'll, I'll just put it out. If there's any other questions, raise your hand. Otherwise, we will, uh, we will end this meeting and we'll see you all in September. Thank you, Christian. Uh, you're more than welcome. Good to see you, Judy and Bill. Um, all right, folks. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for coming, and uh, we'll see you in September. If you have any questions, feel free, as always, to email or call anytime. All right, everyone, take care.